Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, and before we move to questions, I've just got a, uh, a couple of things to say. Firstly, um, well, we thank all our speakers, but um, also a, a thanks to DFID. They have funded both of these books um, and funded the Chronic Poverty Research Centre for what it will be 10 years soon. So we are very appreciative of their support. Um, and if you want to buy the books um, today, they are discounted, um, and you can buy them after the talk in the... Uh, corner and I think it's discounted only for today so hopefully you will make your purchases. Um, we're going to move to some some comments and questions now. Um, if you uh, do want to make a comment just indicate. Um, please uh, <coughs> give your name and your organization and please keep your comment shortish so we can get um, a lot of people speaking and I'll take them comments in groups and speak into the microphone please. So we'll open the floor up now for about 25 minutes of comments. Rafaela Villanca, Head on Household Energy Network. Um, I partially buy in um, the concept, but I have uh, some question marks. I am an admirer of uh, Mohammed Yunus, and uh, intrig intriguingly, is being um, asked to help out the Glasgow, I think, uh, uh, Council uh, with um, <coughs> uh, setting up uh, social enterprises to help uh, taking people who, are, who have been on benefit for three generations out of uh, the loop. And uh, so I was uh, fearing that uh, um, giving money uh, type of schemes could uh, b bring to similar problems. Okay. I think there's a question here. Thank you. My name is Valerie Leach. I work for a research institution based in Dar es Salaam. What advice would you give the Tanzanian government when 40% of the population is under a very basic poverty line, much lower than the, the $1 a day, $1.25 a day. Half the population is children. And there's a great reluctance on the part of government officials to consider cash transfers. There are several pilot, small-scale pilot programs going on now, testing out conditional cash transfers when the conditions are such that they rely on school attendance and immunization services, which are themselves grossly underfunded. Under those circumstances, does a cash transfer, is a cash transfer appropriate? Uh, my name is Mukat Singh. Uh, I come from India. Uh, I have an experience of uh, 40 years on the, at the grassroots. I work for an uh, NGO there, which I set up in 1970. Um, I think it's taken me 40 years to uh, see that this is now happening and people are talking about this. Um, the <coughs> Um, I have seen, I have seen also that uh, not only the poor were, um, uh, people did not um, believe in them, but also did not believe in the uh, people who were working at the grassroots. Um, now, but the, some of the things which I see now in India at the moment, in particularly in my part, which is Uttar Pradesh, uh, in a village, uh, they're not only uh, just uh, microfinance, but uh, there are other ways of giving also, like pensions, like uh, scholarships, like uh, the help to the girls, the students, like uh, the other things. But out of those five rules, which um, have been Know, which you have suggested, what if some of them are not taken care of, or they are not, uh, look, you know. Uh, also, I mean, yes, India has done, in one case, like uh, the assurance, for example, has uh, passed an act, 
uh, to guarantee um, 100 days um, uh, help. But to make improvement, I, I may have missed, but uh, I think the um, training program at the grassroots is very, very important, which I tried myself, and that was um, uh, in the microfinance situation. And this is what is um, missing uh, to a large extent in Indian microfinance and in other, uh, other cases also. So have you looked at that also? I mean, you know, or have I missed it? Two more questions over here, one at the back and one in the front row. Uh, I'm Steve McCarthy. I'm uh, independent uh, in this. I don't belong to any particular organization here. Um, I'd particularly like to put a question to, to David here. Um, the, the fashion in the uh, aid and development business in recent years has been on accountability, uh, on indicators, on measurability, and we've already heard uh, this afternoon uh, evidence-based programming as a phrase used. Now, it seems to me that there's a, going to be a fundamental conflict between this approach and that of actually reaching the poorest, because uh, almost by definition, the poorest can't be, they're, they're invisible, it's very difficult to see them. Um, uh, is it going to really be possible to actually draw the sort of evidence that uh, we, particularly in the rich world, like uh, to, to actually uh, satisfy ourselves that this type of program, I'm particularly thinking of programs for the, for the poorest, are actually going to work, and, and maybe we have to give something up there if we give something up if we want to actually reach the poorest. Thank you. Hi, uh, Rebecca Holmes from the Social Protection Program at ODI. Um, thanks for the interesting presentations and, and the books. Um, we've just been doing some, some recent work on cash transfers, um, mainly in low-income countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so it's interesting to see the differences because really what we've been finding in low-income countries in, in Africa um, is that the coverage of cash transfers is very small scale, only reaching a few, um, few percent of the population um, of the poorest. Also, um, small scale in terms of the value of the transfer as well, really only meeting a proportion of household expenditure. So real questions about how that um, cash or income is actually diluted across um, multiple priorities for the poor, um, investment, education, health, etc. Um, and also that particular donor groups and, and international funding is also driving target groups, so perhaps to orphans and vulnerable children or, or the elderly. Um, so I guess this raises some, some really important questions about how um, donors, how international agencies can, can support governments to make appropriate decisions um, about whether cash transfers or other types of social protection are appropriate for that target group, um, the poorest of the poor. And just secondly, um, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about whether the book um, for giving money to the poor also deals with um, uh, fragile states or conflict-affected countries and how cash transfers may have been used in such difficult contexts. Thanks. Okay, I've got three or four more people. I'm just going to take one more here and then the five other people I'm going to take in the second round. So just take one at the front row here. Thanks. That was, sorry, Claire Malamed from, also from ODI, from the Growth and Equity team. Um, I think these are incredibly interesting and really exciting. You know, it does feel to me like here we've got the sort of beginnings of a, a genuinely new idea in development, which for, you know, a lot of people we've been kind of looking for this for a while and sort of there's been a, quite a lot of bemoaning the fact that there are sort of no new ideas and I feel like this is, is really the beginning of something quite exciting. I also think the points that Joe made about... Um, the kind of the analogy that one can make between social protection now and the growth of welfare states in Europe particularly is incredibly important. I think in all our sort of concern about evaluating development and what works and so on, I think we kind of forget that actually we know a lot. We have by and large eradicated extreme poverty in, in Europe in the last 200 or so years. And although we may not be prepared to wait quite that long again in Africa and so on, I think there is a lot of experience there which we need to get better at drawing on. But my question is about, um, is about the, 
the sort of international agenda, whether there is an international agenda on this. I mean, I've kind of keeping in mind the MDG summit that's coming up in September, the, the G20, the G8, the, the various different international fora in which development is discussed, targets are discussed, new initiatives such as the one we've been hearing about recently on maternal mortality are, are kind of trumpeted, and whether there is something useful that the international community could take up as a sort of international initiative, agenda, target, whatever it may be, on this, and what that might be and how that might happen. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, I've, I've got my list of five or six people, so we'll have those for the second round, and I'll, I'll ask, uh, Joe, do you want to go first? Uh, amazing list of questions. Um, one of the things I want to start, I'm not going to answer specific questions, but try to group things. One of the things that comes out very clearly from this, what we were looking at in the book is the trade-offs that go on at local level in constructing programs. So that whereas my friend from DFID says, oh, well, we want to help countries target, we want to help countries make sure that they get exactly the right groups. Yet what you're seeing at local level is going exactly in the opposite direction of saying we want to get as broadly based as possible that seems fair. So that is in a way the really core contradiction between the donor agencies on one side and the southern governments themselves because the donor agencies say we want to find the poorest of the poor somehow. That popular support, electoral support, means broadly based, even if you don't reach the poorest of the poor. Now, that trade-off becomes really important, I think, in what we think about this. Now, that leads me to the Tanzania question, because one of the things that you say is, okay, <clears throat> you can't afford big programs. But most countries can afford about half a percent of GDP and push it up later. So there are a whole set of ways to do that. South Africa, for instance, started its child benefit with small children first. But it did all small children. Well, actually, it didn't do all small children. It did all small children in the bottom half of the income. The income cutoff was at about 50%. And this is actually based on quality of house. If you have a stone house and a relatively high income, you don't qualify. So the cutoff, the income cutoff was 50%, and then they did an age cutoff, which was very low. That was popular because it was seen as being fair. They then pushed the age up over time. Tanzania, you could do that perfectly well. How much money do you give? I do a lot of work in Mozambique. The average cash income, cash income, of Mozambican rural families is under a dollar a week for the whole family. Now that means that a dollar a week going to a family, 25 cents a week of a child benefit actually doubles household income. That has a very sizable impact even though the amount of cash is small. So that how you juggle this is going to be done locally, but what seems to be the case is that people feel that it's fairer if you're targeting a larger, if, if you're, if you're targeting a group which is reasonably large and seems to be fair. If you're starting to look at weak states, fragile states, however you want to call them, one of the things that is interesting is look how we do electoral registration. I've worked on, written a lot about electoral registration. We succeed in giving photo ID cards with barcodes on them to voters in very fragile states for about $4 a person. We can do that. If we can do that for voters, we can do that for kids as well. Or we can do that for pensioners. Or we can do it however we choose to do it. So that even in fragile states, you can do that. How do you distribute the money? Namibia distributes the money by sending around an armored car that pitches up on the same day every month in each village. Everybody who, the pen, this is a pension scheme. So the little old ladies totter up to the armored car, put their card into an ATM, punch in their PIN number, and get their money out. This works. It works perfectly. It's easy. Now, the thing is that there are all the hundreds of systems, because of mobile phones and financial system transactions in mobile phones, you can set up point-of-sale terminals in shops, for example. 
money can be collected that way. That even works in fragile states. This actually, the thing is, it actually creates an economy because it means that shops have some additional business because they're handing out money, they're taking back that money because people buy things. It, it moves an economy into fragile states very quickly. So that the point is to, is to step away from how do we target the particular poorest of the poor and instead, how do we get a system that people think is fair that can be made to work that gets people enough money to be useful? Okay, microcredit. The reason microcredit doesn't work in Africa, at least, are twofold. One is that the interest rates are very high. Again, in Mozambique, the interest rate is about 10% a month. You can't do that. That does not fund production where you're, it, you, you buy your, your fertilizer and you don't get your crop for seven months. So that's not going to work. The other is the risk. If you're getting a, grant, a cash transfer, you invest some of that money, it doesn't rain, you lose the crop, you're not in debt. If you borrow money, you lose the crop, you still have to repay the debt. Your family go hungry, not just this year, but next year too, because you're having to repay that debt. So microcredit doesn't work very well for production in Africa. It's great for trade, by the way. Um, pension scholarships discussion. Um, how you design this is entirely local. Mexico, for instance, has a wonderful scheme in which not only does the, um, the opportunity Dodds money go to families, but for secondary pupils it goes to the pupils themselves. And girls get more money than boys. And this has actually increased girls' school attendance. So that not only do you give the money to, to the, the family, but the, the school kids themselves get some of the money. That's designed entirely locally. It responded to their worry that the girls were dropping out of secondary school. Now, I think that the final comment I want to make is about accountability. One of the things that actually is very useful about this is it's totally accountable because everybody who gets a grant, you know, puts in a PIN number or puts in a fingerprint. Um, these electoral registration systems, for instance, have fingerprint recognition software on them so that when you go and vote, you, you do a fingerprint and it checks, to see, checks your fingerprint. You can do that. So what you can say to the donors and to your voters is, okay, we have given money to 100 million children in Africa and we can identify every one of those children that we've given money to. So it is super accountable. And you can, you can bring in, if you want, you know, KPMG or any of the big accounting companies or anybody and say, okay, do, do sample accounting of this. It's checkable. And so I think that's one way that we can turn this into something which is accountable is we can actually identify every child who's gotten this or every pensioner who gets it. And you, do, so you send people around and you once a year or once every two years, if you're doing a pension, for instance, you send people around and say, well, are they still alive? Every pensioner has to show up to prove that they're still alive. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, so that we can make these systems accountable, we can make them work, but the trick is that they should be locally based and locally popular and that local people should see them to be reasonable. China, for instance, posts the lists of people who have been given grants so that there's a public check. Several other countries do that too. Is that, would that be acceptable here? Of course it wouldn't be acceptable here, but it is there. So these are, these are all these systems get developed locally and get traded south-south, you know, and, and I get worried about agencies wanting to target precisely. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, yeah let's, let's start at the last question and, and uh, and then uh, I maybe have to to, to the uh, to the first one if I'm lucky. Is this on the international agenda? I'm sure Paul will have a comment on that. But certainly for the MDGs, there have been debates in the Chronic Poverty Research Centre and ODI about whether one could promote social protection as as, as a new sort of MDG. That's actually politically very unlikely. But there's a widespread recognition that all that for. You know, the MDGs aren't meant to be a package that fits together and that actually social protection can improve the dollar a day measures, the health, the gender empowerment, uh, the, the education, and so actually it, it can underpin all of the MDGs, so it needs actually to be thought of for all of them. I was in Istanbul last week with the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Europe, which actually I surprisingly found stretches over the border of Mongolia, uh, is particularly focused on Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and their fourth recommendation, which the, which the uh, UNEC is taking forward to the UN General Assembly, is that social protection should be central to plans for the uh, next 10 years for that uh, 
for that region. Uh, bilaterals, as we've heard, like DFID are putting it on. Uh, one also needs to think though about the those who will uh, who, who will slow down progress. Um, other work I've been doing shows the IMF is likely to slow it down. The IMF just doesn't believe in this. They say this is European social policy. The IMF doesn't do European social policy. That's the chief economist for Africa, uh, and sticking with exactly the same old ideas. Mm -hmm. that, um, people at the IMF tell me they're told to write the MDGs in the introduction, but then they mustn't let the analysis be damaged by writing the MDGs in the introduction. So they are the big obstacle. The other one is, is our elements of the US public, but that's one of the reasons why we did this and did it with Kumarian, mm. because we find in the US that the idea of welfare dependency, even though they may give money away in Alaska, but the idea of welfare dependency, if you give a dollar to someone who's on 50 cents a day, they're clearly going to have a party with it. Uh, that idea is incredibly uh, popular, and we find that in a way it's the US uh, public opinion that is probably more influential and that probably needs to be um, to, to be challenged. Um, in terms of the questions about fragile states uh, and cash transfers, um, yeah, maybe Joe might be able to come back on that one later. I haven't covered that. In, in India, I think it's really important that we push this agenda um, uh, forward, partly because I find in India, as in Bangladesh, we've got these burgeoning middle classes. When they look out of their air-conditioned car windows, they don't like to see this poverty and have these people around who are transmitting communicable diseases and that sort of thing. Well. <laughs> Cash transfers are one way of doing that, but one way of engaging politically with them and getting them to, you know, trying to get through that very difficult message that mm -hmm. actually your tax is stagnant. Actually, middle class has got wealthy and don't pay any more tax. Well, you need to start paying a bit more tax. That needs to be used for cash transfers. You need to be hounding your politicians, thinking about whether this could be used a little bit better. And it's a highly imperfect system, but it's one way of trying to get people who are doing well in growing economies to recognize, no, I want the sort of country that actually I do want, then I may have to engage with these crazy ideas like cash um, transfers. Um, the question about sort of evidence and, uh, 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 and evidence bases, um, I think, I mean, there is this um, problem that we, we sort of have in uh, development overall at the moment about this promise of totally evidence-based policy despite the fact we haven't reached that in rich countries yet, and the Conservative government will still move into non-evidence-based policies domestically, its overseas aid policies, um, certainly to be sold partly to the, to the British public, have to be presented as though there is this extraordinary levels of knowledge about them. Um, but having said that, it is possible certainly to collect evidence on some of these extreme poverty uh, programmes. Um, I'll give an example in a second, but one does need to bear this out, because sometimes actually the weight of evidence that is being demanded would begin to become 20, 30, 40 percent of program costs. And one has to ask, is damaging the program that much uh, necessary? Or, you know, would two or three percent actually give us sufficient trust in it? But I think, you know, BRAC in uh, Bangladesh um, has actually managed to, to get a panel data set running on its ultra poor program. It's done that partly by getting its donors and its donors allocating one to two percent of funding for evaluation but also by co-opting academics from around the world who want access to, to this data and getting them actually to contribute free labor because it achieves other goals that they've got so I, I think you know this um, this uh, is possible but it certainly will be um, difficult on the impact of, of training um, training is certainly a part of, of some effective programs in, in some contexts, but one has to be very careful not to generate supply-led training. If you have agencies that can provide useful training for poor and very poor people, that's useful, but much training in the past has been of people who don't actually know what to do, <laughs> teaching very poor people what they don't know how to do, and we need to make sure we don't get supply-led uh, training. But again, BRAC would be an example where, in terms of sort of poultry training, um, and uh, raising milk cows uh, and horticulture, they've managed to get training packages that can very rapidly get poor and illiterate women into a fairly uh, skilled uh, position uh, on that. In high growth economies, then sometimes there's a lot of room just for copying at, at the sort of mm. bottom end. And if, if, if demand for products that can be produced locally with low technologies is expanding because of the economy, then that there are opportunities uh, there to do. In terms of Tanzania, I mean, a very difficult context, obviously, but um, I mean, two things that one can go for is thinking about the knowledge and making sure that these pilots are being effectively monitored and that if one does actually find ways forward, one can talk uh, with donors and with the government. Mm -hmm. but, but I think the other thing is, is um, you know, 
when there is some knowledge, then looking at the Glen Eagles promises. I mean, Tanzania um, is, is, is seen as uh, as a country that uh, you know that that, that, uh, that that maybe basic services could be put into, but we we keep making these promises. Many African countries simply <laughs> we make the promises. Yeah. Italy's made the promises, and its aid budget is now six percent smaller. Promised to to double it. So in a way, they're, they're on those things. Um, on microfinance and that, I'm a great admirer of Mohammed Yunus, partly because he had great ideas that have taken microfinance forward, which has helped many poor people, and partly because of the image of Bangladesh. He's helped to show the world the way that Bangladesh is, full of great ideas, full of energy, a fabulous country, not a basket case, as Kishan told us. Having said that, this poorest of the poor stuff he does with microfinance, that's not what Grameen Bank d has done in the past. Grameen Bank is now focused on non-poor and actually middle income mm. groups. It's expanding its portfolio massively, but that's actually with small and medium enterprise, which may be really good because that's creating jobs for poor um, people and that, but uh, uh, you know, we, we, we do need to watch that. Certainly in Bangladesh, these cash transfer schemes and asset transfer schemes have been able to reach populations which, when you talk with microfinance field staff, they will say, yeah, we don't work with those sorts of women. Our programs just don't work with those. These new and innovative schemes are trying to work with, uh, with particularly with, with female-headed households in remote rural areas, who've mic which microfinance has kept away from. Um, yeah, maybe I'll make some sort of general points that we'll touch on a few of the a few of the questions. I mean, I, uh, probably should start with uh, with Joe's baiting on, on on the targeting. I mean, I, I think I think this idea that that donors are pushing one approach. And you know, governments would much rather go for a broad-based approach. I think that's true in some places, and I think it isn't in others. I think Tanzania is an interesting example where the reluctance isn't necessarily coming from the donors, um, but is actually you know on the side of government. And I think I don't think that's the end of the story. I think in response to your question, we we in the donor community need to be doing a lot more to engage with the sort of domestic political economy and understanding. What is, that, what is it that's driving people's reluctance and reticence, or what is it that's driving some enthusiasm? Uh, and that doesn't mean just talking to officials in the Ministry of Welfare or officials even in the Ministry of Finance, but sort of starting to understand how these debates are playing out in the political parties. You know, where, where, is, where is civil society on these, on these issues and agendas um, in some of the countries where we're working? So, uh, and I think that, that, that plays out also on, on the international agenda, whether or not we need some sort of international initiative the UN, I think, has, has tried to promote this in some respect with its social protection floor. But actually what you see in a lot of the international fora is that there's a lot of the big emerging economies that push back on this sort of UN-driven approach. Um, certainly countries like India and Brazil don't want this, this sort of top-down approach. Um, they want it to be a sort of domestic uh, exercise. The other thing I just say on the international agenda, it's a classic tension about whether this whether social protection and cash transfers need their own space in the sun, or whether, whether the, the coherent arguments about how they contribute across the MDGs uh, will work. And I think that's the tension that, that we're dealing with all the time, um, certainly. Um, just on the issue of evidence, um, I, I mean, I take what Joe's saying. I don't, I don't think the story is quite so depressing. The, the, the opportunities for using new technology in cash transfer programs, using smart cards, using uh, the rollout of mobile banking, using mobile technology, means that actually it's going to be easier than it was in the past to collect data about who's receiving and who isn't. And I think that that will partly deal with this evidence story. But it, but it needs to, where I, where I think you're right, is that it doesn't need to be about producing evidence for donors, but rather putting in administrative systems in the country that will feed the domestic understanding of what's going on and, and who the poor are. Okay, um, I know I'm going to disappoint a lot of you, but we are actually now out of time. Um, and ODI does like to keep its meetings to time uh, because people have to move on to other meetings. The, uh, the speakers are going to be here for a, a few minutes, so if you do have questions, please come and, or comments, please come and chat with them after the event. Um, please do buy some books um, if you would like to take some away with you. And um, I would would like to thank all our speakers in the usual way for a, and all of you for a very useful and very informed discussion. And um, if you want any more information, please look at the ODI website um, in the next 48 hours. It should all be up there. So thank you all very much.